FDR and the Great Depression, Part 2, The Second New Deal. I've described FDR as perhaps the most popular president in our nation's history, and he certainly was. Uh, a great majority of the American people loved and supported FDR, and as I've described to you, uh, felt a, a real sense of obligation um, to him. At the same time, though, he was a very polarizing president, and he had many critics, despite his popularity. He, there were many people who uh, opposed him for one reason or another. And what we will see is that he had critics from both sides of the political spectrum. Um, just to review for a moment, if you're not familiar with what I mean by that, uh, when we talk about politics on the right, we generally are talking about um, conservatives, Republicans. Uh, most of the constituents in this regard would be um, a little bit better off, wealthier in many cases, um, extremely wealthy, big businessmen. And from the left, we're generally talking about uh, liberals and Democrats and farther out on the political spectrum to the left are things like socialism and communism. So FDR heard um, criticism from both ends of the political spectrum. Um, let me start with those uh, opponents coming from the right. Uh, there's a, actually a famous book written about the critics of FDR. It's called Voices of Protest, which is the nature of the title of these next couple of slides. Um, Remember, of course, FDR is a Democrat himself. He's on the left uh, side of the political spectrum, and depending who you talk to, um, fairly far out to the left. Anytime you have um, large government programs uh, in terms of social welfare, taking care of the masses, um, these are on the left side of the political spectrum. So it's no surprise that he had critics from the right. These are his political opponents. They are often Republican. They are big businessmen. And uh, we certainly shouldn't be surprised to hear that. Among his critics coming uh, from the right, from Republicans, were uh, Herbert Hoover, who FDR uh, defeated in that 1932 presidential election. I suppose to his credit, Herbert Hoover didn't just curl up under a rock somewhere or disappear from the public eye. He actually remained very much a public figure and spoke out uh, extensively against FDR. Among the criticisms that Herbert Hoover raised was that uh, under FDR and the New Deal, the federal government was simply getting too big. Now, bear in mind, Herbert Hoover is the man who didn't want the federal government to be responsible for taking care of the people and launching these kind of welfare programs. So none of this is a surprise. Um, but he, he made another perhaps more compelling argument about the nature of big government. And one of the things that Hoover said was that the bigger the federal government gets, the more it begins to limit and curtail our individual freedoms. It's just the nature of big government. Um, and I suppose if you take things to the, their logical extremes, well, the absence of government at all, the individuals have absolute freedom. There isn't anyone kind of looking over them. The other end of that spectrum is with an all-powerful uh, government, sort of like 1984-style um, uh, government, well, then individuals have no freedom, and the government is absolute. So Herbert Hoover is concerned about the government getting too big and thus limiting our individual freedoms. And I certainly think there are merits to an argument like this. Uh, and, and we continue to debate similar things even today. Um, you can look at things like uh, the Patriot Act, uh, some of the other issues that I've mentioned already. Um, in the interest of national security, our federal government begins to limit some of our freedoms of protest and uh, the right to free speech and things like that. So I think Hoover is, uh, is on to something there.
Another of the groups from the right that criticized FDR was a group known as the American Liberty League. You see the emblem there at the top with the cracked Liberty Bell. Uh, the American Liberty League was created by business leaders in 1934. And in many ways, their uh, issues were related to the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA, which I talked about uh, in the previous lecture. Um, these are big businessmen, and the NIRA was that act that I described asking big businessmen to cooperate with the government and to keep people on the payroll and those sorts of things. So businessmen had problems with that. Uh, among their, and both Hoover and the American Liberty League had a whole laundry list of complaints, so I'm only mentioning a, a few things here. They argued that the New Deal was anti-big business, uh, and you know, so asking business to make these sorts of compromises was one of the things they targeted. They also argued that the president was getting too powerful. Um, that you know, we have a government which is based on uh, separation of powers and balance of powers, checks and balances. So what's going on here? Well, we've got uh, FDR, the most popular president in our nation's history. He obviously dominates the executive branch. He also has huge majorities in both houses of Congress, so he dominates the legislative branch. There's only one branch that is still sort of checking the powers of the president, and that is the courts, the Supreme Court, which I've mentioned a couple of times already. So they're nervous. What's going to happen if, if he takes over the Supreme Court as well? He might as well be a dictator. The American Liberty League was also concerned about taxes. Um, and again, this is a, a typical complaint um, coming from the right. So um, I have one other group to mention coming from the right. But in general, I would say... Who do we think FDR is going to listen to more? Is he going to listen to critics from the left, from his own party, uh, or is he going to listen to critics from the right? Uh, he hears these complaints coming from the right, but they are his political opponents anyway, so he's not as concerned about trying to appeal to the people making these kinds of complaints. The last group that I want to mention who were critical of FDR from the right, uh, interestingly enough, was the media or newspapers of that era. And this might sound a little bit strange if you're familiar with the, uh, the common thought of the liberal media, uh, which is still um, very commonplace today. Um, but not all media is liberal, and particularly when we think about the owners of newspapers or the owners of radio stations. Uh, these tended to be very wealthy individuals, uh, many of whom were Republicans and came from the right on the political spectrum. I think a, a good modern parallel is Rupert Murdoch and Fox News. Uh, we have the cliche of the liberal media, but in the case of Rupert Murdoch and, and Fox News, they come uh, at things from very much a Republican and, and from the right of the political spectrum. And so for the most powerful president in our nation's history and the most popular president, we see a surprising number of cartoons and editorials that were very critical of FDR um, and the New Deal and his programs. And that's represented in the cartoon on, uh, on your screen, um, taking a bit of a jab against uh, FDR, and just the idea that the New Deal was kind of experimenting, dangerously so, with our nation. Uh, the, the parallel in this cartoon, you know, that this is, the, the country is like a patient, and uh, FDR and the New Dealers are um, just experimenting. You can see on the right-hand side the uh, person in the background. I hope they don't wear him out before I have a chance to try my experiment. So all of these um, new dealers are, um, you know, just conducting a bunch of experiments on the country. And at the, at the bottom on the right, you see he's been um, put under by 
ether, which is propaganda. So this is very much a, a critical um, cartoon of FDR and the New Dealers. Uh, there were many, many others like that. And so you might be surprised, looking back on the newspapers of the day, uh, expecting to see just a wave of congratulations and compliments of our most popular president. Uh, and in fact, there's a, a lot of criticism of FDR in the media. So FDR certainly had his critics from the right, um, but he was much more attentive to those critics coming from his own side of the political spectrum, in many cases from his own party, um, from the left. Uh, why is that? Well, certainly on the one hand, they are much more in tune with his own political thinking and the kind of programs that he wanted to put in place and was putting in place. But also, when we think about the left, we're really talking about a much larger group. FDR, in some ways, is seeing the, the criticism coming from the left. Well, it's coming from poor people. It's coming from farmers. It's coming from millions of people across the countryside. Criticism from the right is coming from wealthier people, more powerful people, perhaps. But from the left, you're looking at millions of potential voters. One example of these critics from the left is Upton Sinclair. Now, we've met Upton Sinclair once already in this course. He is best known as the author of The Jungle, the famous book published back in 1906. Upton Sinclair was a uh, professed socialist, so he's far on the left of the political spectrum. Uh, he remains in the public eye after 1906, and in 1934... He decided to run for the governor of California. Now, there's a part of this that begins as perhaps just a publicity stunt. He wanted to kind of get word out there. He wanted to test out a few ideas and, and see the response. But he, he, as many, were surprised to see his campaign uh, really catching on. And it started to look like he might actually win the election. His platform was called EPIC. And you see down at the bottom left, how to end poverty in California. That's epic. End poverty in California. Um, among the things that this plan called for, and you see up at the top the little the, the mascot or the emblem of epic is the honeybee, that most uh, socialist of creatures. All the honeybees contribute equally to the hive. One of the things that Sinclair called for were cooperatives for the unemployed. That is, all of these people kind of moving in together, living in the same um, little village or co-op, and the, everyone contributes equally to the work, and everyone reaps uh, equally from whatever profits there might be. And so in these co-ops, there would be farmers, there would be uh, workers, there would be plumbers and roofers and carpenters and everything, and everybody kind of pitches in equally. Uh, he also called for similar things in Hollywood, which is another of the big industries in California. And there were many, many out-of-work uh, writers and actors and directors and these sorts of folks. And so he um, called for them as well to sort of pool their resources. Everyone worked together. And if there's any profits to be made, um, they would all share equally. Sinclair's relationship with FDR... Um, is a little bit uncertain. He needed and wanted the support of FDR, and because he's coming from the same side of the political spectrum, he thought he had it. On the other hand, FDR was a little concerned that Sinclair was too far out to the left. He's talking about all these socialist programs. FDR wasn't quite ready to publicly endorse all of these ideas. And so Sinclair's campaign, which had gained momentum... Uh, for a time, began to be undermined under uh, circumstances that remain mysterious even today. Uh, a series of negative advertisements uh, are produced about Upton Sinclair. Uh, there are uh, many cartoons uh, coming out about Upton Sinclair. And so his campaign began to founder, and ultimately uh, he ended up withdrawing from the race, even though he still got a lot of write-in votes on Election Day. Um, was FDR directly responsible for... Uh, Sinclair's campaign going awry? 
Probably not, and we don't have any evidence of that. But FDR didn't come out and, and sort of help uh, this person running for his own party. FDR didn't try to uh, prop up his campaign and support him. And so there are some historians who kind of question whether FDR wasn't a little bit happy to see Sinclair's campaign undermined. Another of the famous voices of protest from the left was that of the man um, pictured on your screen, Huey Long, who was, uh, at the, the time that we're talking about, 1934-35, was a senator from Louisiana, U.S. senator, but he had also been the governor of Louisiana for many years. Um, I grew up in Louisiana, and when you grow up in Louisiana, you hear a lot about Huey Long. Uh, he's a towering figure in Louisiana history, and there are many... Uh, kind of landmarks and fixtures in the state of Louisiana that bear his name, and many of them were built kind of on his watch. Um, for instance, there's a huge bridge across the Mississippi River, which is the Huey P. Long Bridge, uh, just one of the many landmarks that bear his name. So Huey Long is um, governor and senator of Louisiana as the um, depression sets in, and Louisiana was actually getting through the early stages of the Depression uh, reasonably well compared to other parts of the country, largely because of Huey Long and his programs. He, he was uh, very aggressive in his assistance for the unemployed and the poor in the state of Louisiana. He implemented a vast campaign of public works, um, employing workers to build things like that bridge, the Huey P. Long Bridge. Um, his signature um, accomplishment was the building of a brand new uh, state capitol building in Baton Rouge. Uh, Huey Long was so successful in Louisiana, and his programs were getting so much publicity, that he began to um, decide to run for the presidency in 1936. He was going to challenge FDR, and of course they're from the same political party. The, the campaign that he proposed was called Share Our Wealth. This was his program. There are many different elements to it, but even just the title itself gives you a, a, an idea of what this was about. It's largely a uh, campaign to redistribute the wealth. Uh, we're going to share our wealth. That is, we're going to kind of take some of the um, things from the wealthy and share them with the impoverished. Um, free public education, reductions in the price of food, uh, and some other programs that uh, many of whom of which are ultimately adopted in this country, but they they had not been adopted yet. Things like old age pensions and um, veterans benefits. But his most controversial program called for both minimum and maximum salaries. Now, minimum wage did not exist at that time, it will be coming along shortly, and we'll talk about it later in this chapter. Uh, so, so minimum wage was something that a lot of people were talking about, and there actually was a good bit of momentum building toward that. But maximum salaries. Maximum salaries. Think about what that means over a certain amount of money. And he called for a maximum salary of $10,000, which at that time was a lot of money, but not a huge amount of money. Uh, it might be the equivalent of $200,000 or something like that today. Um, maximum salary. So if you earn any more than that, everything else would be taxed and would go into this plan to redistribute it to the poor, the elderly, and the needy. So how do you think people responded to that? Well, predictably, anybody who was living in poverty and on the lower end of the economic scale would have embraced these kind of programs because they were all going to be bumped up under this minimum salary. But if you earned more than the maximum, you obviously would not have supported this and would have been very frustrated uh, at the idea. And one of the interesting things about Huey Long is that the wealthier you were, 
the more you probably hated and feared Huey Long. Uh, in other words, if you were a doctor making $210,000 a year, um, perhaps his ideas would not have been that awful uh, in your view. But if you were a Donald Trump type figure and you're making $10 million a year and everything but 200000 would have been taken away for tax, well, then you would have had a huge problems with Huey Long. In other words, he had a lot of very wealthy and very powerful enemies. Ultimately, in September of 1935, uh, so even before the election in 36, Huey Long was assassinated. He was shot by a man named Dr. Carl Weiss. Uh, the suggestion from just his name, this is a doctor. He came from a wealthy class, but his parents were very, very wealthy and uh, longtime opponents of Huey Long. And so Huey Long, uh, another of these kind of critics of FDR from the left, is also removed from the scene. But notice that a lot of his ideas... Uh, will ultimately be embraced. And this is a testament to FDR hearing these ideas, hearing this protest, recognizing that millions of people are attracted to these ideas, and ultimately FDR will begin leaning in that direction himself. I want to mention two more of these voices of protest coming from the left. Uh, one of them is named Father Charles Coughlin, and he's pictured at the bottom of your screen. I would just point out to you, I've selected this picture intentionally, and I'm not sure if the photographer had anything in mind, but uh, you may notice a resemblance to another historic figure of this same era, uh, that of Adolf Hitler. Um, the demagogic way in which he's pounding his fist and kind of shouting. The way the shadow is falling across his face, which makes it look like he might even have uh, a Hitler-esque mustache. Well, the resemblance to Hitler is something uh, that I've selected intentionally, and I'll explain the connection in a few moments. Um, Charles Coughlin was a Catholic priest from Detroit, he had the most popular radio program of that era. It was called The Golden Hour of the Little Flower. Uh, this weekly radio program reached up to 45 million listeners uh, in a time when the population of the country was something like 125 million. So he's being listened to by as much as a third of the country on a regular basis. Um, and so he's a little bit like... Um, some of the, the huge kind of radio talk um, personalities that, uh, that are out there today. Um, I describe him as coming from the left, although his political views were vague at times. Um, and he claimed not to have political views himself. He claimed that his interest was only in religion. But he did uh, lean on political views uh, in many different cases. He attacked uh, big business, he attacked socialists, he attacked communists. His only claim was that he was a champion of democracy. And yet he also attacked the New Deal. He attacked FDR as kind of a stooge of the government. Uh, he was worried that the New Deal was not moving fast enough. He thought FDR was sort of in the pocket of big business and the banks. Ultimately, Charles Coughlin was undone by some of this uh, demagoguery. He was also an anti-Semite. He denounced Jews and communists. And by the mid-1930s, he was becoming a, an avid supporter of Hitler and continued with that support into the late 1930s, even as it became more and more clear uh, the nature of Hitler's plans and, uh, in fact, his evil intent. Uh, towards the end of his career on the radio, Charles Coughlin was more and more prone to giving just racist and anti-Semitic rants. Uh, he was becoming something of a lunatic on the air. Um, finally, in 1940, he was forced off the air and forced to shut down his radio program. 
The last of these voices of protest that I want to mention was Dr. Francis Townsend. You see him on the right. He's actually the gentleman in the, the little circle uh, on, the, on the left side of the picture on the right in this picture uh, labeled 1936 Old Age Unrest Townsend Clubs Convention. Francis Townsend was a doctor from Long Beach, California. Uh, he was getting up in years himself, but for years his practice had concentrated on the elderly. Uh, and he was very concerned that more and more of the elderly were being sort of left without care, uh, without people to take care of them. And there wasn't any plan at that time, anything like Social Security. And so Townsend put together a plan calling for old age pensions and other uh, systems that would care for the elderly in this era. Townsend was wildly popular. You see from the picture there, he could attract crowds of tens of thousands of people as he gave these speeches related to old age pensions. Uh, FDR hears these kind of uh, issues. He notices the huge crowds. Uh, he hears Huey Long. He hears Upton Sinclair. And eventually these voices of protest are going to pull FDR himself further to the left. And we're going to see things like old age pensions, like minimum wage, and some of these other programs being put into place. <laughs> 